uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Will Farr today uh, to give this colloquium. Uh, so uh, Professor Farr did his uh, bachelor's at Caltech and PhD at MIT. Uh, after that, he, he held uh, postdoctoral positions at uh, Northwestern. And uh, then he was a senior lecturer at University of Birmingham in the Institute for uh, Gravitational Wave Astrophysics. So uh, Professor Farr has a, like a variety of interests. One of them is gravitational wave astronomy, compact objects, uh, and also uh, gravitational dynamics of uh, planets and stars. Uh, and today he'll be talking about uh, cosmology and fundamental physics uh, from stellar mass binary black holes. Uh, in particular, maybe what happens when you hit uh, black holes with a hammer. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my plan, and things never go according to plan, but my plan is to spend about half my time on this and half my time on that. And you have some control over that because I'm happy to take questions while we go. So if you want me to spend longer, you can ask questions. And if you want me to spend less, you can shush your neighbors and put your hands down. Um, OK, so I am going to be talking about gravitational waves from stellar mass black holes. Uh, we're going to zip through a quick orientation of the instruments we use to detect these, uh, these signals. I'm a member of the LIGO collaboration. We are now the LIGO, Virgo, and COGRA collaboration. So LIGO is an American project that has detectors in Washington State and Louisiana. Virgo is a European project that has a detector in Italy. Kagra is a Japanese project that has a detector in Japan. There are detectors in the works in India, discussions about placing them other places around the, uh, the globe. Um, but LIGO was the detectors, the pair of detectors that were operational for the very first detection. Um, I should mention, by the way, if you snap that QR code, which I just took off the screen. Uh, you can get these slides, and it's really useful because all of these are actual links. LIGO's author list is alphabetical. So there's this Abbott paper, and then the next Abbott paper, and then the next 10 Abbott papers. And so you can figure out which one I'm referring to by clicking on the link. Um, but this paper is the paper describing the first detection, GW150914, which is now eight years ago almost. Um, and the LIGO instruments at the time here is Washington State, here is Louisiana. That's 10 light milliseconds apart. This is about the orientation of the two detectors. They're all as aligned with each other as they can be given the surface of the Earth being curved. Um, and a schematic of how they work. So gravitational waves are disturbances in space and time. To detect them, you have to measure distances or times. For times, there's been some very exciting pulsar timing results recently that I'm not going to talk about, but you should absolutely read about. Here, we're measuring distances. We're using an interferometer to do metrology. A gravitational wave comes through and wiggles these free swinging test masses at the end of an interferometer arm. Different numbers of cycles of the light fit into these cavities, come out to the beam splitter, interfere constructively, destructively, and produce outputs here at the photo detector. Um, the instrument is constrained by its physics to be sensitive at certain frequencies. This is a, a plot of the noise in the instrument around the time of this first detection, so 2015, 2016. We've moved on from here. We're almost a factor of two lower in noise level in the modern day instrument. But the basic characteristics of the noise are the same. In particular, the instruments are most sensitive in the audio band right around 200 hertz. And for gravitational waves, that means they are optimized to detect stellar mass compact objects. The gravitational waves emitted by a 10 solar mass black hole orbiting another 10 solar mass black hole at sort of their innermost orbit are roughly 200 hertz. So we're not talking about supermassive black holes. It's hard for us to get much out of very, very light, you know, I don't know, Earth mass black holes, if such things exist. We're talking about stellar mass objects, neutron stars, and black holes. Just as importantly for the rest of this talk, the fractional distance measurement, the strain, displacement, reaches a sensitivity of about one part in 10 to the 23. And that limits the amplitude of the waves that we can detect. Strain is a dimensionless quantity. 
gravitational waves, just like all processes that we know of, conserve energy, which means their strain squared, that's the energy part, has to fall off like one over R squared as the waves move further and further and further from their source, right? That's the inverse square law, photons do the same thing. That means the strain itself has to fall off like one over R. The electric field and radiation also falls off like one over R. The, the strain is dimensionless. The only radio, the only uh, length, dimensionful quantity we have in this problem is the horizon scale of the emitting black holes, the wavelength of the waves. All of these things are sort of the size of the Schwarzschild radius. And for a 10 solar mass black hole, the Schwarzschild radius is to one gigaparsec as one part in 10 to the 23. So we are optimized to detect waves at the frequencies emitted by solar mass compact objects or tens of solar mass compact objects that are at gigaparsec distances. And that's more or less what the first detection was. It was several hundred megaparsecs away. In the first couple of years of running, we had another 10 black hole detections and a neutron star merger as well. That comprised the very first catalog, gravitational wave transient catalog number one which was released in this paper. You can see if you have good eyes down here, the little neutron star, it was like a 1.35 on 1.35. These are all the black holes. And you see that this follows this prescription that, that I just discussed. The black holes are all tens of solar masses living at you know, one to a few gigaparsecs, redshifts about 0.5. So we're seeing these sources from about halfway across the universe partly due to our sensitivity, which much prefers to have equal mass mergers and partly due to astrophysics, which seems to prefer to make equal mass mergers, all of the sources observed in this first catalog were consistent with being pairs of identical masses. Through 2019 and in 2020, we ran in what we call our third observing run, which we split into two halves, O3A, which resulted in the gravitational wave transient catalog number two, many, many, many more sources, um, partly because we are a coherent detector. We're not a telescope. A telescope is a photon bucket. It destroys the photons. They hit the CCD and leave charges, or they hit a calorimeter and make it hot. We know gravitons are destroyed in this measurement. We're sensitive to the amplitude of the gravitational waves, which means if we bring our noise level down by a factor of two, we can see the same source twice as far away. Two cubed is eight times the volume. So sensitivity improvements for us very rapidly lead to much larger numbers of sources, faster than the equivalent sensitivity in a you know, optical CCD. Okay, so in the six months of running, we got another 30, 40 sources. Most of them are black holes. You can see here in total mass and mass ratio, uh, the full catalog and some of the interesting ones. Uh, we saw for the first time a source that was confidently not a pair of identical black holes, GW1904-12, which has a mass ratio of you know, somewhere around three to one. We saw a really weird source, GW1908-14, uh, that is a 23 solar mass black hole on a 2.6 solar mass something. We actually aren't sure if that something is a neutron star or a black hole. Um, and it's very hard to make these sorts of systems. That's still a very active area of uh, investigation. I'm not going to spend more, any more of my talk on stellar evolution uh, and how you might make this, but it's a very interesting thing to think about. So if you want to chat with me over coffee or cookies. Um, we saw another binary neutron star merger where both components are less than three solar masses. And we saw GW1905-21, which is the heaviest confidently detected source to date, total mass in the sort of 150, 160 solar mass range. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that system in the second half of the talk. The second six months of that run produced a similarly large catalog, which is GWTC3. That included for the first time neutron star black hole mergers. GW200115 is an object which is definitely a neutron star merging into an object that is definitely a black hole. Um, the black hole is like seven solar masses, the neutron stars one point few. 
Um, and of course, a large collection of other, you know, by now becoming fairly routine binary black holes. LIGO is on today for our fourth observing run. I don't know about this very instant, but uh, yesterday, 2309.11, we found something that's probably a binary black hole. Uh, it was pretty loud. It was in a single detector, so we don't really know where it was on the sky. It was somewhere toward the north celestial pole. Um, and, you know, uh, earlier in the week, we found some others. We had an event that was retracted. It turns out since turning on in late May, we found somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 significant detection candidates. So yet another sensitivity step up. We're getting them about one every three days now. The plan for this run is to go for 18 months, which would add 190 sources to our existing 70, 75 source catalog. So this field is rapidly evolving. Um, okay, what do we learn? We learn a ton of stuff. One of the two things I'm gonna focus on today is gravitational wave cosmology or really cosmography. I want to measure the expansion history of the universe, distance versus redshift. And in gravitational waves, our life is very different from electromagnetic observers. For us, distances are really easy. For electromagnetic observers, distance is the name of the game. That's the hard thing to measure. And the reason distances are easy for us is there is a universal luminosity. C to the fifth over G has units of luminosity. It's three times 10 to the 59 ergs per second or something like a million times the supernova luminosity. And every binary black hole merger up to factors of order 10, 20, 30, achieves this luminosity in its final orbits, independent of the mass scale. The energy radiated goes like some fraction of mc squared. The time scale over which it's radiated goes inversely with them, so the luminosity is a constant of nature. So these are standard sirens is the lingo that people use. Um, and in that way, gravitational wave sources, binary black hole sources, can play a role very much like type 1a supernova as standard candles for photons, except, apologies to anybody who does 1a supernova, we actually know what's going on here. Now I'm going to get fired. Uh, okay, but, you know, there's no gain without a certain amount of pain. In our world, redshifts are hard. All of those mass measurements that I just gave you come from the frequency evolution of our sources. How fast are they in spiraling? And the frequencies of our gravitational waves, just like any radiation, redshift over cosmic history. So if I didn't know what the mass was supposed to be, all I measure in the observer frame is whatever the true mass was times one plus the redshift of the source from the expansion, the cosmological expansion acting on my radiation. So what to do? I want to make distance and redshift measurements. Well, one thing I can do, it's kind of easy mode, it's almost cheating, is use photons and gravitational waves. This is a huge effort. So this, this series of papers here, um, this first paper is about GW170817, the first pair of neutron stars that merged. Those were detected both in gravitational waves and electromagnetically. In fact, throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, a bright dot appeared soon after the gravitational wave detection in a galaxy, NGC4993. So now you can do the thing that's easy in each band. Gravitational waves give you the distance, look at the galaxy with a spectrograph, you get a redshift, and you're making a gravitational wave Hubble diagram, right? Distance here in megaparsecs, this was 35, 40 megaparsecs away. Recession velocity, not really. Cosmological redshift over here, it was something like 0.01. Um, you know, that's the original Hubble diagram. That's what we've got. We're not even quite to 1928 yet, but we'll get there. Okay, well, one issue though, is we're not getting there very fast, right? LIGO has been running. Now there was the O2 observing run. There's the O3A, O3B. We have exactly one of these sources with a confidently identified counterpart. 
Maybe we'll get more. The expected number in this 04 run is like three. But you know, Poisson with a mean rate of three is not the kind of thing you want to like bet your cosmography on. So is there something we can do in the gravitational wave sector alone where we don't need to depend on getting lucky and finding counterparts? And there is, there's a number of things, but one of the things you can do is you could say, well, if I knew this, I was just somehow told magically, like that black hole merger was a 30-30 system. Then measuring this tells you that, right? You just invert this relationship. Okay, well, how would I know what the mass is? Well, astrophysics can imprint mass scales on the compact object distribution. So the first place that this was written about is in 1993, it was pointed out by Chernoff and Finn. There's another, if you're into gravitational waves, there's a Finn and Chernoff 93 paper that's detector sensitivity that has a ton of citations that everyone's heard of. This is not that, this is the other 93 Chernoff and Finn paper. But they pointed out that neutron stars in our galaxy, we measured a number of neutron star masses, they all tend to cluster around 1.4, you know, 1.3, 1.5. There's a fairly narrow peak in the neutron star mass function. So if you could observe neutron stars in gravitational waves at cosmological distances, you would see that peak redshifting and you could measure redshifts. And this idea was kind of fleshed out and, and actually demonstrated you know, in sort of a more realistic setup, Taylor and Gare in 2012. The problem is that neutron stars are light, one point few solar masses. Light, if you think back to our sensitivity, means quiet. And quiet means we can't yet see them to cosmological distances. So that's great, but this is something for the next generation of detectors. That's what's highlighted in this. What could we do with black holes? Black holes are loud. I already showed you. We can see them to redshift, almost to redshift one. Well, this comes back to a paper by Maya Fischbach and Dan Holtz from 2017. This was back in the day when we had, when they were writing this, we had four binary black hole systems. But already they'd noticed none of the black holes that we observed were very heavy. There were no hundred solar mass black holes in that population. And yet those should be the loudest, the ones we can see the furthest. So the title, the title of this paper is literally, Where Are LIGO's Big Black Holes? We should have seen them. They should be even more observable than what was observed. So evidently, there must be some physics that prevents or at least strongly reduces the merger rate of these very heavy black holes. And in fact, there is some physics that we think might do that. I'll tell you about it in the next slide. Once we had a catalog of 10, this became even more apparent. So if you take the, the 10 uh, mergers that are in GWTC1 and you fit them to some kind of mass function that has a cutoff, there's a maximum mass, you find that that maximum mass is you know, 40 or 45 solar masses, right? It's basically this system was the heaviest known at that time. How light can I possibly make this system before I become inconsistent with the data? And that's the heaviest black hole I could possibly have observed. This is the mass of the primary. Yeah. In principle, any mass scale would work. So we actually measure chirp masses, which is the you know, combination better. But the chirp mass is not amenable to stellar physics. The stars don't know about the chirp mass individually. So if there were you know, physics calibrations that gave you an absolute mass, you might hope it'd show up in the primary. That's the logic that's operating. But people have tried this with all sorts of different mass scales. So then I pointed out in this paper that if indeed there's a cutoff and it's standardized, you basically have an absorption line. So this is a hypothetical, the blue dots here are like a year, the orange dots are five years of running at design sensitivity. So late 2020s, LIGO. This is the distance. You know, you see now we're pushing out towards 10 gigaparsecs when we get to design sensitivity, the luminosity distance and the detector frame primary mass. And I just imagined there was some mass function here that has a cutoff. You're basically tracing an absorption line in the mass spectrum. And you can see as you go out in distance, the detector frame, the redshifted mass increases and you see this trailing off of the black hole mass function. This side of the figure is with perfect mass measurements. This side there's air bars on the mass measurements. 
if you fold in our sensitivity, um, you know, you can basically say, what redshift distance relationship do I need to flatten this out in the source frame? Right, I need to assign redshifts to these distances so that this cutoff occurs at a constant mass scale, and I get a mass function that looks like this instead of something that evolves. And it turns out that you could measure the expansion rate to about 3% at redshifts near one with five years of data. That's about 1,000 black holes. It might actually be the case that we get to 1,000 black holes sooner than what we were thinking in 2019. They seem to be coming faster. Um, now, this is actually not a great way to measure the Hubble constant because none of our black holes are local. You really are making this measurement at redshift almost one. But if you use this to put an absolute distance to redshift one, then you can pull it back through supernova or whatever you want locally. So in terms of H naught, that's two kilometers per second from H naught, which is cute. If we're still arguing about the Hubble tension, this is one way you could resolve it. Of course, the field has moved on. That was back when we had 10 black holes in our catalog. Now we have 70. When you have 70 black holes, you start to see more structure. And so now we think the mass function of black holes, it's not something simple, it's like smooth with a cutoff. Instead, it has a big peak at 10 solar masses, probably falls a little bit, has a very identifiable peak at 35 solar masses, falls down more, and then kind of straggles its way out here towards 100 or maybe a little bit more solar masses. And each of these features is in principle something that you can latch on to to measure redshifts. So in some ways, the story is better than it was in 2019. And in some ways, you still face a fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is right here. So we went from a mass function, you know, we measure this, we measure this, that's fine. These are just measured quantities. And then we made up a cosmology that makes that mass scale non-evolving with redshift. That's cool, as long as the mass scale actually doesn't evolve with redshift, right? What if it does? Do we know what's causing this structure in the mass function? Can we expect that it might be you know, something that occurs basically the same way over cosmic time? Or is it just a contingent thing that we see bumps in certain places? Well, I don't know about this 10 solar mass bump. That's a, a little harder to, to fathom. But here at the 35 solar mass bump, there's some hope that this might be coming from more fundamental nuclear physics. And the idea here is massive stars have very hot cores and they are radiation pressure supported. So they're fusing rapidly in their core. Those photons as they leak out are providing a pressure support. If however, the core temperature gets hot enough, the tail of the thermal distribution of photons in the core can reach 511 keV. And when that happens, the photons can pair produce. And instead of being a relativistic fluid that provides lots of pressure, they make electron positron pairs at rest which provide no pressure. So the pressure support in the core collapses. That causes the core to shrink and heat up. This problem gets worse and worse and worse and worse until you detonate the core. So it's a, therm it's a premature thermonuclear detonation of these massive stellar cores. And then depending on the structure of the core, you may drive an explosive shock wave through the star that burps out some outer layers this is called a pulsation, and the whole thing would be the pulsational pair instability process, PPISN. Or if the core is sufficiently dense and loaded with enough nuclear fuel that the collapse causes an energetic enough explosion, you may just blow the whole star apart in a luminous supernova. So what would have become a high mass black hole at 50, 60 solar masses instead died. And it died because of nuclear physics. Now you may remember from stellar structure courses, working out the central pressure and temperature of a star is the kind of thing you can get pretty good just from order of magnitude arguments. So the hope is that this would be a more robust physical process that's less dependent on things like metallicity and environment and, and so on. 
And in fact, that is the case in our current models. So this is a paper by Rob Farmer from 2019. It's showing the core mass in massive stellar models versus the remnant black hole mass at different metallicities. So this is like one one thousandth of solar. This is like 0.1 solar. We're talking about several decades worth of metallicity evolution in these stellar models. For small cores, as the core mass increases, you just make bigger black holes. That's the sort of standard core collapse. Eventually you run out of fuel, collapse to a black hole, you're done. However, when the cores get hot enough to have this instability, the pulsations start, and the relationship between the core mass and the remnant mass softens. You're losing mass in the pulsations. So a heavier core does not one-to-one -one contribute to a heavier black hole. Eventually, the remnant mass reaches a maximum, and then finally, you have the massive explosions, and the remnant mass goes to zero. You've just disrupted the whole star. Anytime you have this kind of nonlinear relationship between the core mass and the black hole mass, even if there is no structure here, it's a featureless power law initial mass function, you imprint structure here because objects pile up where this turnover is. Finite range of core masses can contribute to a single black hole mass. So if you build simple parameterized models, so this was simulations using MESA, which are not necessarily perfect in terms of modeling the pulsations and the ejection of material and all that hydrodynamics, but are at least attempting to do things from first D principles. This is a linear function pasted onto a quadratic. So this is the kind of thing model we'd use to fit the mass function. But it looks about like this, and it has the same essential feature, which is at low masses, the relationship is one to one, and then it softens. And if you put in a power law core mass, initial mass function, you get out a black hole mass spectrum that has a bump right here, and then dies above some maximum mass where the stars start getting disrupted. And the crucial thing, so first, if you believe this story, nuclear physics is imprinting a mass scale in the mass function. So cha-ching, this is great. It doesn't depend strongly on metallicity. You see here, the metallicity is moved by two decades and the mass scale is moved by 5%, maybe less. So that's good. But thirdly, even if you don't entirely believe this, because of the way this physics works, the details of this peak depend on this relationship. So if this relationship is changing in cosmic time, not only is the location of the peak going to change, but its shape, its height, its asymmetry, all of those things will change. So in particular, if you change the minimum mass at which the pulsations start, the peak shifts to the right, but it doesn't get any taller or steeper. If you change the maximum black hole mass, but keep the minimum pulsation mass fixed, you see the peak moves to the right, but it also gets taller. One mass scale, the start of pulsations is fixed. Now you encompass more of the IMF and make a taller peak. So just by measuring the shape, you can distinguish these two features. If this is truly consistent nuclear physics, none of this motion should be happening. Similarly, by changing the amount of scatter in the relation, you can make the peak sharper or narrower. And um, you know, so you can, you can infer the shape of the peak and use it as a calibration or a control or a check to make sure that you aren't deluding yourself into thinking that this mass scale is constant across cosmic time. I say you because we cannot yet do this with our 70 black holes. If you fit this kind of model to the 70 black holes that we've seen, Something like half of them live in this sort of 20 to 60 mass solar mass range. So a lot of our sources live here. And you see, we can you know, see a peak and maybe some asymmetry, but we can't really tell. If you have fine eyes, this doesn't come out so well on the projector. But we can't really tell whether it's a steep, sharp peak with a big drop or a gentle, broad peak with a shallow drop yet. But we will be able to when we have thousands of black holes. So this provides the hope, at least, that this 35 solar mass peak may be a reliable redshift measurement that could get us to a few percent in H of Z over the next few years. 
Okay, the icing on the cake, gravy, whatever, whatever your preferred topping is, um, is that there is additional structure in the mass function. We really don't understand what's making this sort of global peak at 10 solar masses. But again, if you see that, it should be stretching and redshifting consistently with the 35 solar mass peak, right? They can't move like this from redshifting. They have to, you know, move homologously. Yeah. Um, in this model, that's basically imposed. In fact, we can talk over cookies, but I can tell you we're a little uncertain whether it's steep or fairly flat, but we know it has to come down about an order of magnitude from the peak here to say five solar masses. Yeah. Um, yeah, so don't believe this figure, but there is in fact a drop there. Um, so Jose Azquiaga and Dan Holtz wrote a great paper in 2022 that said, if you use the next generation of LIGOs, four times large, uh, sorry, 10 times larger on the ground, built in the mid 2030s, you can see a black hole merger to redshift 100. So you get all the black hole mergers in the universe, several hundred thousand a year. So if you run one of these 3G detectors for a month and you use the 10 solar mass peak and the 35 solar mass peak and you check their consistency with each other, calibrate the redshift measurement, uh, you can place constraints on H of Z out to redshift three or better, which are a factor of two here, or maybe even three, better than uh, DESI, which is a large scale structure uh, BAO ruler measurement. Um, so that's, the future is bright, we hope. All of this you know, remains to be achieved. There's plenty of work to do in calibrating uh, these sorts of measurements, but I think it's promising that even if we don't deliver enough counterpart red shifts from neutron stars, gravitational waves will really deliver a cosmology, a, a cosmography that is at the few percent level um, in the next decade. I'm gonna take a deep breath. If anyone wants to ask questions about cosmography, now would be a good time because we're gonna transition to fundamental physics. Yeah. Yeah, this is at like 45, right? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I should be less good. We actually don't know. That's a puzzle. All of the nuclear physics knobs, we think we could turn to change the structure of the core, make it easier to push this up than down. My personal bet is the model of pulsations here. It, I mean, they did a great job. This is really a fantastic paper. This modeling is really hard. Now, you know, I'm going to say something bad. The models of pulsations was very rudimentary, right? So doing the hydrodynamics right, you really just need to kick off an extra like five solar masses and you can get to the mass scale we see. So, you know, I don't think that's a, some kind of fundamental problem, but that definitely remains to be settled. There could be, I, I don't think you can lose 10%. Is that, that's a little big, isn't it? I, yeah, I don't know. So there could be these sorts of effects. You know, it might be as well that like something weird happens in the final collapse where there's a part, you know, you don't quite have complete fallback like in the modeling community because we're, you know, it's a hard problem we're trying to do our best. People tend to assume either you have a supernova and you leave behind a neutron star or everything goes into the black hole, but it doesn't. So, you know, maybe, and rotation helps with that as well. So it's, you know, I think that's not a fundamental obstruction, but it's definitely puzzling and, and an area where if you're interested in stars, a lot of work could be done. Yeah. Uh, yeah, more or less, or I don't know. The, the rate projections were like three orders of that, like it's hard to say, but yeah, probably we'd hoped like very early on, really early, like early 90s, all of the LIGO white papers selling the instrument focused on neutron stars because we could see neutron star binaries in our galaxy that would merge in a Hubble time. Whereas we had not seen binary black holes that would do that. At the same time, you can see black holes to much further distances, you know, you're surveying a much bigger volume. So nobody was really like jaw on the floor surprised that our first detections were black holes or that we're seeing so many more than neutron stars. So. Yeah. 
so this calculation is a single star, but to model the effects of being in a binary, they have completely stripped its hydrogen envelope and left it with a narrow layer of helium on its surface. Yeah, something. Again, this is a really fantastic paper, but like that's not what binaries actually do. So it's just an approximation. It's the best effort. Yeah. It is a near certainty. Yeah. Um, in all sorts of ways. We should talk over coffee because otherwise I will never get to the end of my talk if I start to listen to you. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna switch. So that was cosmology. Now I'm gonna talk about fundamental physics. So in this picture, the black holes are just fundamental physics objects and we want to use them to probe strong gravity, okay? Um, and we are gonna hit black holes with hammers, except we can't go up to them and hit them with hammers. So we're gonna hit them with other black holes and we're gonna listen to how they ring. So I wanna motivate this with a question from math, which is, can you hear the shape of a drum? Katz asked this question in the mid 20th century. It turns out the answer to this question is no, you can't. Here from Wikipedia are two drums, more than two drums, all of whom have exactly the same mode frequencies. So if I hit them, I get the same composition of tones. I look at their spectra and they're identical. Obviously they are different shapes. However, if the drums don't have kinks in them, if they have a smooth boundary, then it turns out, yes, you can hear the shape of the drum. So that's kind of interesting. This is like drum spectroscopy, probably not the sort of thing you do in physics departments. I don't know, maybe for fun. Um, we certainly can see the shape of a hydrogen atom though. That's spectroscopy, spectroscopy, right? That's atomic spectroscopy. Um, you know, this is the Lyman series of transitions in hydrogen um, and they follow a simple rule, the inverse wavelength or the energy is a universal constant, the Rydberg constant, times this numerology, one minus one over n squared, gives you all the transition frequencies here. Um, and of course now, right, we understand that, thanks to the Bohr model or actual quantum mechanics, whatever you wanna say, you know, this contains some universal constants and reflects the electromagnetic interaction in the hydrogen atom. And this part here comes from doing quantum mechanics and calculating the eigenfunction and the eigenvalues. Um, if you didn't know that quantum mechanics was the right theory, it makes very definite predictions about what this number and these numbers ought to be. And in fact, confirming them in atomic spectroscopy was a major boon to the, the early theory. So what about black holes? Let's see if I can get this video to play. It's gonna load up in a minute. It turns out, right, any system I have some system and I linearly perturb it. I hit it with a hammer, but not too hard, right? I don't break it. I linearly perturb it. Generically, it has modes and that includes black holes. So this is a merger simulation of two black holes. They're meant to be reminiscent of the first detection. So like a 30 solar mass, 40 solar mass pair. This one's a little heavier. Um, and they're in their last few orbits. So they're going around each other and they get closer and closer together. And at this moment, they're frozen now, they sort of form a black peanut. They go from being two isolated black holes to having a common horizon. And then they radiate gravitational waves away until the remnant single black hole settles down to what we think is the Kerr solution, particular space time it describes a rotating black hole. Those last gravitational waves coming out can be thought of as a disturbed Kerr solution. It's been hit by a hammer and it's radiating. It must be radiating using its modes. So if we could do spectroscopy on those last few cycles of gravitational radiation, we could test whether the space time here is really the Kerr space time or whether it's something else. In the same way, if you had a different theory of quantum mechanics or a different strength of the electromagnetic interaction, the hydrogen spectrum would come out different. Okay, this is an old field. It goes all the way back to the 70s with the first numerical scattering experiments. 
more numerical scattering experiments. In the early 70s, Tukolsky and Preston Tukolsky realized that you could actually do this almost pen and paper. The Kerr solutions perturbation equations are separable if you use the right coordinates. Um, the mode structure is very much like an atom. There is an angular component, a generalization of spherical harmonics, carries angular quantum numbers L and M. And there are radial eigenfunctions, N equals one, we call the fundamental, N equals zero, excuse me, we call the fundamental. One is the first overtone, the second overtone, the third. So there's this infinite discrete spectrum of modes. Um, you know, in 1980, that while they're coined the term black hole spectroscopy, and this continues to the present day. Something recent, okay, so that's from 1970, something recent that's surprising though, was in 2019, Matt Giesler um, and collaborators took a look at a very high accuracy numerical simulation of a black hole merger. They extracted the L equals M equals two spherical mode, Okay, so the angular content of this is L equals M equals two. And then they put in a very large number of radial overtones. The fundamental and six more overtones. And what they discovered was basically from the peak of the gravitational waveform, which occurs in, in you know, there's no time coordinate here because it's all scalable, occurs at this point, the, the signal the waveform now, not necessarily the space time, but the waveform of the black hole merger can be described at almost part per million, part per 10,000, part per 100,000 accuracy by just summing up these seven normal modes. That's a little weird. Everybody believes that when the Kerr solution is almost the right space time, and everything is very tiny perturbations. You should be able to do perturbation theory, linear perturbation theory and describe the space time. Time is not a real thing, right? This is not a, a single path space time. This point at infinity is a well-defined time, but doesn't correspond to an instant in the black hole space time. But if it did, this point would map most, you know, generally to the time when the horizons touch. That is not a linear time. It, you know, the space time, I showed you the video, the space time looks like a black peanut, not like a sort of weakly perturbed Kerr space time. But somehow, in ways that we don't really understand fully and is a very active area of theoretical investigation, those nonlinear parts of the space time don't show up very readily in the waveform. Now, why is this a revolution? Well, these are normal modes, but they're actually quasi-normal modes. They're damped, right? Radiation is happening. Energy is leaving. These are exponentially damped sinusoids. So if I can't describe the waveform as normal modes until here, I have a very quiet signal. If I can describe the waveform as normal modes here, I have a very loud signal. And I might have some hope of actually doing spectroscopy in present day data instead of waiting for a signal whose overall signal to noise ratio is in the thousands. No. This is a fitting function. The modes, their damp sinusoids, have their frequencies and damping rates fixed by the calculation of perturbation theory in the space time that obtains here. Their phases and amplitudes are in principle knowable from this early state, but here treated as free parameters. When you do that, so that's like saying the spectral content of this part of the signal is very, very nearly at the part per thousand or 10,000 level what the normal modes say it should be. And that's surprising. No, not the seventh order, the seven overtones. So you need to include, you know, at least five or six overtones, so five or six independent radial modes to get the fit to the part per 10,000 level. 
That's right. We are surprised that that's such a small number because if you drill down to the black holes, the perturbation is order one. This is literally linear perturbation theory just with lots of modes. What the hell? Yeah, right. That's, that's what's surprising. And there are arguments in both directions that this should and shouldn't work. Empirically, it works very well. Where are the nonlinear? And you can show that by, you know, suppose you relax the assumptions that the modes have to come from the final state curve space time, you let them be free, their frequencies and damping rates go to the right place. So it really is the spectral content of that waveform looks like normal modes from that point onward. Almost. There's, you know, at the sort of part per 10,000, this is a logarithmic scale, is a 10 to the minus five. The, the mode frequencies of the higher radial modes don't quite want to go to the true mode frequencies. They're displaced by a little bit. But to detect this part in 10 to the 5 shift in the mode frequencies, you'd need signal to noise ratios of hundreds or thousands, which we don't have today. So at some point, this may be a systematic, but it's not a systematic for us. Okay, let's skip that slide. Um, so Max EC is a postdoc at CCA. Um, and also the second author on the Giesler paper was inspired to look and see if you can do this in real data. And the answer is that you can. The very first black hole merger, 1509-14 at 30, 40 solar mass in spiral. If you start from the peak of the waveform in Hanford, that's the blue, uh, Livingston, Louisiana in the orange, uh, you can uh, quite confidently detect the presence of the fundamental the lowest order mode and the first radial overtone in the data. Um, this is what it looks like, what the waveforms would look like. Effectively, the observed waveform is this H here, the, the solid curve, excuse me. And then the fundamental is this dashed. And the first overtone, which decays faster, is this dotted. And effectively, what's happening is that the signal does not quite decay exponentially over its first one or two peaks. The overtone and the fundamental are out of phase with each other early on. So the overtone dies and the fundamental appears and that combination means you don't achieve an exponential decay until you get later into the wave. It's basically what we see. And if you ask what mass and spin gives us the modes that we see in this system. So again, you let the frequencies and damping rates of the modes be free. If you don't use an overtone, you get a final mass of 90 and a spin of 0.9, that's this blue curve, which is completely inconsistent with modeling the whole signal with real templates that incorporate all the in-spiral merger ring down physics. But if you allow there to be a fundamental and an overtone, you get this distribution of masses and spins, which is totally consistent. If you throw in another overtone, things remain consistent, but now you don't get a confident detection. So we assert we've detected at least two modes in this system, which we think are the fundamental in the overtone. Okay, there's been some controversy. You can ask me over coffee. Uh, okay, great. But if we can detect two modes, one mode gives us a measure of mass and spin. That's like measuring the Rydberg constant by the energy of one transition. The second mode has no more freedoms if the spacetime is Kerr. It has to appear at a frequency and damping rate that are related to the first mode. If we no longer enforce that restriction, we introduce parameters that are the deviation of the overtones frequency and the deviation of the overtones amplitude. And we ask, how does the signal constrain those? So zero deviation is the space time is Kerr, the modes are the regular Kerr modes. This is the range of allowed values that we get, which is completely consistent with Kerr. And you can see in frequency, we actually prefer something quite close to the Kerr value for the overtone. We don't like the overtone to be much higher or much lower frequency. It's like a 20% test of GR directly in the strong field regime. Okay, it's not something maybe to write home about yet, but you stack 20% on top of each other, pretty soon you're at 1%, you know, you see how this goes. Okay, in my remaining like five minutes, I wanna talk about a second signal, GW190521, which is that unusually heavy merger. Unusually heavy means the merger occurs at a very low frequency. 
which means just about all of the signal that pokes up above LIGO noise is ring down in this event. This is like almost a total merger ring down, no in spiral part for this event. When you analyze it with waveform templates, they would like it to be sort of an 80 on 70 solar mass um, merger. And they would like it to be highly spinning. This shows the magnitude and the radial direction and spin tilts around the axis here of the secondary and the primary. And you can see we really would like an in-plane and pretty high spin configuration. Great. If that's true, what that means is that as the black holes are in spiraling, the orbital plane is processing because the total angular momentum, which is the sum of orbit plus spins, is misaligned with the orbit. So the orbit is processing around the total angular momentum. And in particular, at the point of merger, if you have a non-processing system, then the angular momentum of the orbit is aligned with the final state angular momentum. So here's the orbital is schematically, here's the orbital angular momentum. Here's the final curve, you know, remnant angular momentum. They're all the same frame. And so these two blobs of mass make what's a dominant 2-2 angular content perturbation on this Kerr remnant. If instead the spins are processing, then the total angular momentum is not aligned with the orbit and the remnant will point in a different direction. In the orbital plane, this is a 2-2 perturbation, but the modes are defined by the remnant spin axis. So you have to rotate the 2-2 perturbation into the remnant frame and the 2-2 harmonic becomes a mix of 2-2, 2-1, 2-0. So this sort of cartoon argument, um, Hungry, by the way, is here. I mean, I don't know if he's in this auditorium, but he's, yeah, hey, man, right on. Hungry and Harrison Siegel, who's a grad student working with me, and Max, EC, and that's me, uh, are writing up, you know, this uh, idea right now. But the idea is, you know, this is the schematic. You might expect that for a processing system like this, you would see additional fundamental modes. You wouldn't just see 2-2 angular content. You'd see 2-1 angular content. And it turns out we did. Um, okay, so let's see, do I have, yeah, okay. Uh, right, so let's focus on this right-hand plot here. Um, this is in frequency and damping rate space. So that defines the damped sinusoids, right? This is the you know, inverse of the time constant, the frequency. And this is showing in these lines here that are labeled NR sur, the prediction for what frequencies and damping rates the 2-1 mode, the 2-2 mode, the 3-1, and the 3-2 ought to have given the full analysis of the whole signal with a template waveform that can predict this physics. These colored curves, which get darker as you go earlier in the waveform, zero here is what we think the peak of the emission was, minus 10m is quite early, plus 10m is quite late. These colored curves show the frequencies and damping rates that we extract from doing spectroscopy on the signal. And you can see that starting basically from even before the peak, we quite nicely find a 2-2 mode, a 2-1 mode, and a 3-2 mode. And in fact, I'm not showing you on this plot, but if we fit this with just a 2-2 mode with the sort of in-plane blobs coming in the orbit, no misalignment expectation, we do not get a consistent mass and spin with the full analysis with a templated waveform. So in order to match the physics expectation from analyzing the full waveform, we actually have to put in a 2-2 and a 2-1 mode. The 3-2 is a less certain identification. We think it's probably there, but it's not quite so solid. We're going to skip that. You can play the same game and do a test of GR. And you can see that, again, the preference, if you let the 2-2 modes frequency move, the 2-1 mode now giving you the reference for the mass and spin, if you let the 2-2 frequency move, it prefers the GR value and falls away a little bit to the sides. If you let the 3-2 frequency move, it really would like to be right where GR is. And so you put this together, and again, it's about a 10 or 20% confirmation, if you like, or at least 10 to 20% consistent at the 10 to 20% level with the expectation from the Kerr spacetime. 
Okay, so where are we? We're doing spectroscopy with black hole ring downs. We're sort of in that area of spectroscopy where you put different salts in a flame and it has different colors. But as our signals get louder and we stack more and more and more of them on top of each other, you know, the Kerr solution is unforgiving. Those frequencies are determined uniquely by the mass and spin. That's it. So it has to come the same way every time. And so stacking tens or hundreds of signals on top of each other, we can reach the percent and even sub percent level verifying the, the Kerr space time. And with that, I will stop and take questions. Going back to stellar physics, we talked about the masses of the stars, but there are also these high effective measurements. That's right. And uh, I gather high effective tech. So the you better define it for me, but it, it's smaller than one might expect for binary system. Right, that right? I mean, there's some puzzles around. It is small. Okay, so yeah, high effective is a mass weighted. Uh, combination of the Z components of the spins. So project the spins on the orbit, weight them by masses, average together, that's chi effective. And it's the first, almost literally, not quite, the first term that depends on spin that enters the PN series that controls the in-spiral phase. So we measure it well. The distribution of chi effectives is an interesting probe. Uh, this might be what you're getting at partly. If the spins of the objects are isotropically oriented, chi effective is on average zero because it's projected onto the orbit. But if the spins are isotropic, they have net zero projection on the orbit. That is not what we observe. Here's zero. This is sort of like, Point 0.1 maybe. This could be as big as one if both spins are maximal. Um, we aren't totally sure about this side, but we observe it to be the distribution in the population of chi effective to be centered at point 0.1, pretty narrow, something like 0.05 width. And all of those things are a little surprising. If it had been big and broad, we would say, yeah, okay, that scans. When they collapse, the stars spin up, you get some spin. If it had been exactly zero, we'd say, yeah, that scans, right? The stars throw away all their angular momentum and are born with zero spin. If it had been symmetric, that would indicate that, you know, there's a tumble dryer and everything is isotropic dynamical formation scenarios. It being a little displaced from zero with possibly a tail to negative values that spin pointing down, but not centered, you know, all of those things are surprising. And I don't think we really understand them in great detail. Is that sweet? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I remember that there were some suggestions that 1905-21, the precession effect could also be explained by eccentricity rather than spin misalignment. Does mm -hmm. your work kind of disfavor that hypothesis then? Or? So I don't, and I think probably no one does exactly know what the expectation is for the excitation of ring down modes from an eccentric merger in any fantastic detail. That is something we are very interested in studying. You know, in principle, right, you kick the remnant black hole, it always radiates at the same frequencies, but now we're talking about the amplitudes. So the fact that we see a 2-1, is that indicative of the precession, but not eccentricity? I think that's basically the question you're asking, and I don't know the answer to that, but I would very much like to, and people are working on it. You should also talk to Hungry. Like regarding your uh, like estimate of Hubble uh, based on the mass distribution, like what do you think are like the biggest systematics? Is it like uh, uh, time delay distributions? We don't know. If so, probably if in fact that thirty-five solar mass bump is the pair instability, and there's not something weirder going on, then I think it's going to be it's that metallicity effect that you saw, which is not large, but also is at the few percent, maybe five percent level. 
and that does fold it, you know, so early in the universe, this gas is low metallicity, the stars and black holes that are formed come from that low metallicity star formation. The delay time distribution then tells you whether the early universe low metallicity objects appear prominently at late times or not. The longer the delay times are, the better the systematic is because you just mix everything together at all times. And so the mass function is not evolving, but all those things we don't know. But I think the metallicity effects there are probably the biggest systematic. And we hope that we can fit them out by measuring the shape. If somebody asked a question about nuclear physics, if the bump isn't from pair instability, all bets are off. Do you think that you have multiple uh, shape like you said that? Oh, yeah, if you have multiple bumps, bumps, you can still try to do this. That's the point of Jose's paper, Esquiagas and Holtz. It, it's less clear that you can get to the percent level without like third generation detector numbers of sources that let you investigate this in detail. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.